In session one, we looked at the dire need for deliverance. I shared my own experience and how the Lord began to teach me. Obadiah 1.17 helped us to understand why we need to labor to see our people set free from demonic bondage. I then talked about how demons gain access. We looked at sin and legal rights and coming under the authority of the enemy. In this session, The Way to Deliverance 2, we will look at understanding slavery, delegated authority and power or gifting. We will then learn how Lucifer lost his delegated authority and became Satan. How he stole man's authority over the earth. Then we will look at how the enemy gains a foothold in our lives. The principle of the yoke and how habitual sin opens the door to the enemy. Let us pray. Precious Father, we welcome you this morning. We need your Holy Spirit, who is our teacher. Help us understand truth and apply it. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now let me explain this slavery that we come into through another picture. In Genesis 1.1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then in Colossians 1.16, it says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and are in the earth visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Now these two verses tell us that God created the heavens and the earth, the visible and the invisible, two realms. In other words, God created a spiritual realm and a natural realm. The spiritual realm speaks of the angelic beings that inhabit that realm. The Bible tells us that God created angels and archangels, the seraphim, the cherubim, and all the heavenly hosts. Amongst the archangels was Lucifer, who we know was the one who led the worship in heaven. Isaiah 14, 12 tells us about Lucifer's expulsion from heaven. In Isaiah 14, 12, reading there, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? Now, when God created Lucifer, he gave him power or gifts and delegated authority to use them. These gifts are without repentance. As the word says in Romans 11.29, For the gifts of God, for the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Delegated authority, on the other hand, is the permission to use your gifts and is only given when someone is in a right relationship of love and obedience. Looking at the word authority, which is really delegated authority, we learn something from Luke 7, 8, when we look at the centurion who comes to Jesus. And he says, For I also am a man set under authority, 
having me having under me soldiers and i say to unto one go and he goeth and to another come and he cometh and to my servant do this and he doeth it now when we look at the context of this verse we know that the centurion's servant was ill and wanted jesus to come home and heal him but when he saw demons leave at a word and sick people get healed at a command understanding came to him and he said i also am a man under authority having soldiers under me normally one would say i also am a man with authority for i have soldiers under me the centurion understood that because he was obedient to caesar he received delegated authority and so he could tell soldiers to do this or to do that come here or go there he understood that soldiers obeyed him because of his right relationship with caesar now when he saw jesus command demons to leave and people getting healed he realized that jesus was under the authority of someone much higher than caesar he could see that jesus was under the authority of none other than god and because jesus was under authority he could exercise authority from all this we see that delegated authority or the right to use our gifting is based on a right relationship of obedience and it is not something that we have but permission that is delegated to us because of our obedience and it can be taken away when we are disobedient we said that god gave lucifer power and delegated authority based on his relationship with god from isaiah 14:12 we know that lucifer rebelled and sought the worship for himself whereupon god cast him out of the, out of heaven lucifer became satan and lost the delegated authority that he was given but the lord did not take away his gifting he is on earth now but without delegated authority now genesis 1:1 says that god also created the earth the natural or the seen realm and the crowning glory of god's work was the creation of man in genesis 1:26 and genesis 2:7 reading in genesis 1:26 and god said let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth and then in genesis 2:7 the bible tells us and the lord god formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul so in genesis 1:26 god created adam's spirit and in genesis 2:7 he created adam's body he then breathed adam's spirit which he created in genesis 126 into his nostrils and adam became a living soul so god created adam and to him also he gave gifts or power and delegated authority the gifting and ability were given to work the garden and take it to the other corners of the earth He also gave him delegated authority to have dominion and rule the earth. So here is Adam upon the earth 
with delegated authority and power and gifting, and so is Satan. Except that Satan has power without any delegated authority to use it. Now we know what happened in the Garden of Eden. And this is important to see and understand. In Genesis 3, 1 to 7, I will read all these seven verses to you. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of the tree? Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God knoweth, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes will be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. Now here we see how Satan tempted Eve and through the temptation got Adam to obey him. The minute Adam did so, he actually rebelled against God and in obeying Satan, Romans 6.16 came into play and Adam became Satan's slave. Adam came under Satan's authority, as Romans 6, 16 tells us. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Adam not only became Satan's slave, but he also handed over his delegated authority to rule the earth. And have dominion over it to Satan. Their rebellion had serious consequences. They lost their glory. They were filled with shame. Fear gripped their hearts. And they had to sew aprons out of fig leaves to hide their nakedness. But what was even worse? was that they no longer had dominion over the earth. They had lost their delegated authority to rule. We see the outworking of this in Matthew 4, verses 8 and 9. Again, the devil taketh him, Jesus, up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And say unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. When Satan promises to give Jesus the glories of this earth, if he will bow down and worship him, Jesus does not argue with him. For he knew that Satan is and was the ruler of the earth. Now, what has all this got to do with our subject of deliverance. Simply put, it shows us how the enemy gains a foothold in our lives. Just like Adam was given the earth and he had authority over it, in the same way, every person is given a spirit, soul and body and he has authority over all three parts of his being. Now we saw how Satan took away Adam's authority over the earth through sin. One act of disobedience 
one act of obedience to the enemy, in like manner, he comes to tempt us to commit sin in our souls or body so that we can, so that he can gain authority over our lives and bring us into slavery. When an evil thought, a sexual thought, or worry, or anxiety comes into our mind, we don't realize that it is the enemy trying to take over our mind. We allow those thoughts to come in, and we dwell on them. The minute we do that, we have not only obeyed Satan in the temptation, but we have also lost the authority we had over our minds in that area of thinking. After that, he bombards our mind and keeps bombarding them with those kinds of thoughts. And we are not able to resist him because we are slaves. Slaves to him in that area of our thought life. As an example, let us look at sexual thoughts. Once the enemy has enslaved us with those thoughts, it won't stop there. But it will lead to sexual fantasizing or pornography. Which, will, which, though it still involves the mind, will then lead to masturbation or even a sexual encounter. And then the enemy has authority over our mind and our body too. The enemy will not stop until he has completely enslaved the person and his aim is to kill and destroy. So when we obey the enemy, we become his slaves and we come under his authority. Now another picture of authority and slavery. I would like to give you this picture of what happens when we are enslaved or come under the authority of the enemy. Which will help us understand why it is so hard to break free of this enslavement to the enemy. Deuteronomy 6, 3 says, Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee, in the land that floweth with milk and honey. The Hebrew word used in the phrase, Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, is the word Shema, which in English means a yoke. Let us look at the context now of this verse. The Israelites had come out of Egypt and were on their way to the promised land. In Deuteronomy 6, they were camped at Mount Sinai. They were being led by the pillars of cloud and fire. They would now have to move through a desert and God wanted to give them something that would take them on into the promised land. And so he presents them with a the yoke and at Mount Sinai God gave at Mount Sinai, God came down to speak to Moses and the people, and he gave them the Ten Commandments. In Deuteronomy 6, verses 3 to 5, Hear therefore, Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that thou mayst increase mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee, in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. So God gave them the first commandment and he said, Be careful to observe to do it, that it may be well with you. 
God was in effect saying to them, come into the yoke with me through obedience and I will lead you into the promised land. In the New Testament in Matthew 11, 29 to 30, Jesus also presents us with a yoke. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. How do we take Jesus' yoke upon us? It is through loving obedience. Now in Romans 6.16, we saw that we become the slave of the one we obey. In other words, Obedience brings us into slavery. We can become slaves either of the Holy Spirit or the devil, depending on whom we obey. Let's look at slavery through the yoke. We can look at this slavery as a yoke that we receive from the one we obey. We all know how a yoke works. A farmer will usually yoke a new ox with an experienced one. And as the new ox moves along with the experienced one, it learns how to pull the yoke and pull the plow. At Sinai, God was inviting his people to come into a yoke with him through obedience so that he could lead them right on into the promised land. And in the New Testament, Jesus invites us to come into his yoke with him, again, through loving obedience, so that he can lead us into the fullness of his calling. Now, looking at sin, legal rights, habitual sin, and authority. Coming back to the consequences of sin, we saw that when we sin, two things happen. The first is that we give a legal right to the enemy, which is cancelled only when we confess our sin. This is as far as most Christians go. And the result is that we fall into habitual sin. In other words, that sin becomes a habit through the authority that we have given to the enemy. And that is the second thing that we need to deal with. What has now happened is that through obedience to the enemy, we have come under his authority or become his slave. Another way of looking at it is that we have been yoked to him. And he will keep dragging us deeper into that sin. That is why we see that an alcoholic keeps drinking more and more alcohol. Now remember these two steps. The first is confess. The second is renounce and break authority. Just like when we sin, we cancel the enemy's legal right through confession. So also the authority that we have given to the enemy needs to be renounced and broken in Jesus' name. That means when we sin, we need to do two things. We need to confess our sin and cancel the legal right of the enemy. The second step is that we need to renounce and break the authority that we have given to the enemy in Jesus' name. If we do this quickly, the enemy will have no hold over us and he will not be able to enter. But if sin becomes habitual and continues for some time, then an evil spirit can come in. Habitual sin opens the door to the demonic. Ephesians 4.26 says this, Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your anger. Neither give place to the devil. These scriptures tell us that we should not give place to the enemy. If anger becomes a habitual sin, then we will be giving place to the enemy and a spirit of anger will come in. 
And if that happens, then it has to be cast out. So, we see that there are three stages for a demon to enter. We sin and give the enemy a legal right. We also give him authority over our lives so that the sin becomes a habitual one. If this continues for some time, then we give place to a demon. Now, casting out the enemy without violent manifestation. In order to cast out the evil spirit, we need to confess our sin, as I just said, so that the legal right is cancelled. We then need to renounce and break the authority that we have given to the enemy. In other words, we break the yoke that we have come into with the enemy. And only then can we cast out the enemy in Jesus' name. Once we have dealt with the legal rights of the enemy and broken the authority or yoke, we can cast out the enemy very easily. He will leave quietly without any violent manifestation. Remember the story I told you of the young man who violently manifested? All that will not be there. The enemy will go out quietly. So concluding this session, we saw in this session the way to deliverance too. We looked at understanding slavery, delegated authority, and power of gifting. We saw how, so how Lucifer lost his delegated authority and became Satan. How he stole the authority that man had over the earth. Then we looked at how the enemy gains a foothold in our lives. The principle of the yoke and how habitual sin opens the door to the enemy. In the third and final session of the Way to Deliverance 3, we will see how demons come in through the generational lines. We have them coming from our forefathers. We will talk about dealing with generational sin and the self curse. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for what we heard this morning. We give you praise, honor, and glory. Lord Jesus, once again, we remind ourselves that you came to destroy the works of the enemy. And so, Lord, we ask that you would help us, anoint us to be doing exactly the same thing. Destroying the works of the enemy, setting people free, and letting them go on to fulfill their destiny in Christ Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.